In the fall of 2023, the 15th of October, I'm here with Rodan Kurt Jacob. He is a ceramic arts teacher from the United States. We were on a trip to Jindazhen. Specifically, we made our way to the Gaoli National Mine Park. It's about 50 kilometers away from the Jindazhen downtown. It took us one hour driving each way back and forth. The park was worth the journey. With few tourists around, basking in the brilliant sunshine and fresh air, our goal was to explore the history of the thousand-year-old Chinese Gaolin clay mine. There was a story happening in Gaolin National Mine Park, talking about who the China's earliest industrial spy was. There has been a misconception for this renowned German geologist, Rithofen. Exploring the park, we find a monument dedicated to Rithofen, indicating his visit to Jindazhen in 1872. So his stay here was just a few months, focusing mainly on geological studies. His exploration of ceramic production techniques and raw materials in Jindazhen was limited. Rithofen referred to the mineral raw material as calling clay, which combined with the glaze materials, gave Jindazhen and ceramics their unique qualities. Now, if people turn to Google with the keywords ceramic industrial spy, Wikipedia pops up with a name that caught our attention, Francois. A Frenchman with a rather tricky name, but luckily he also adopted the Chinese name in Hongxu. That brings us to the 17th century, where intellectual property theft didn't involve elaborate software programs. Back then, all it took to steal trade secrets was a Jesuit missionary with an eye for detail who was fluent in Chinese and willing to spend a lot of time in ceramics factory. When Francois joined the priesthood in 1682, he probably didn't plan to become the world's first industrial spy. As the historian Robert Finlay writes in The Pilgrim Art, Cultures of porcelain in world history, Francois was a skilled translator with a passion for the curious and unusual along with a gift for sifting and marshalling information. Known for his friendliness and wisdom, he was sent to China in 1698 along with nine other missionaries. As Finlay explains, Jesuits at the time saw their missionary work as a kind of back and forth. As they spread the teachings of Christianity and Western science to other countries. They gathered valuable local knowledge. In return, priests come back from their missions with everything. Francois Another name in Chinese is Father Yin, was used in China, arrived in China in 1698 as a Jesuit priest. Spending over a decade in Jindazhen, during 1709, he successfully infiltrated local factories, even mastering the Chinese language to communicate with local workers learning the entire ceramic manufacturing process. Living in a time when Europe was just starting to emulate Chinese ceramic production techniques successfully between 1712 and 1722. So now we can match the time together. 
The intriguing part is how this French priest managed to learn craftsmanship. You know, it was a difficult job. Many trade secrets were kept within Chinese families, passed down to the next generation only when the previous one retired. Because Chinese typically passed down the know-how only to sons in Chinese families, not even to daughters. He initiated this by utilizing what we call French wine diplomacy, gifting low-king officials red wine, Jin De Zheng, and then under Fu Liang Porcelain Bureau was where Francois established connections. He further impressed by gifting French red wine to the emperor, earning local trust. By the time he left, Francois had acquired detailed knowledge about the origin of Jin De Zheng ceramics the calling clay saws, glaze, and the firing process in wood kilns. In 1710, he sent a comprehensive letter to the Jesuit missions, detailing his observations, which later the Jesuits made public. Let's read part of his first letter. The visits that I've made from time to time at Jin De Zheng have given me in turn an opportunity to instruct myself concerning the manner in which one makes this beautiful porcelain, which is so admired and which is exported to all parts of the world. I believe that a detailed description of all that is concerned with this sort of work should be of some use in Europe. Francois even sent back some clay samples from Jin De Zheng to Europe. Europeans, upon receiving the samples, sourced the continent for similar materials, eventually finding them in Mason, Germany, a location resembling the terrain of Jin De Zheng's Yoli ancient town. In 1710, a German ceramic production company cracked the code of Chinese ceramic production techniques, introducing porcelain similar to Jin De Zheng's in Europe. Let's take a video tour to Mason, the German ceramic manufacturer officially launching white porcelain in 1710, akin to Chinese Jin De Zheng ceramics. Mason, much like Jin De Zheng, not only perfected ceramic production, but also ventured into porcelain painting, polychrom, blue and white porcelain, and even showcased artistic sculptural products. Today, Mason has not only thrived in producing daily use ceramics, but also established a ceramic museum attracting visitors from Europe and worldwide. After Europe successfully emulated Jin De Zheng ceramics, China's ceramic exports significantly declined post the letters of the Qianlong Emperor in the Qing Dynasty. There are two main reasons. One reason is China's flawed foreign trade policies. And another reason is Europe's establishment of its manufacturing factories capable of supplying the European market. Fast forward to the 21st century, many situations have been changed. Nowadays, entrepreneurs worldwide prioritize industrial technology, and there is a strong awareness of protecting intellectual property rights. For example, China's DD runs similar car rental service like Uber in the US, or even giants in the Chinese internet fields, if they plan to go to the stock markets in Hong Kong or United States to attract new investors, they requires Chinese government scrutiny due to national security concerns. 
Additionally, there are sensitive matters like non-compete clauses and confidentiality agreements for departing technical or high-level management personnel. These regulations prevent the unauthorized use of theft of companies' core data. Let's take another case. China was trying to partner with the Europeans on the Moon Space Scientific Project. The United States government stood out to prevent it. Thanks for watching my video of this fascinating journey from ancient Chinese ceramic secrets to contemporary corporate safeguards. If you have different points of view or find any details in doubt or want further discussion, please drop your lines under the comments below.